So guess what I found out? Regardless of popular belief, tigers, yes, tigers, and many other big cats are in fact domesticated. Actually, it's weird that more people don't realize this. Tigers being domesticated is just common sense, but sadly, people have been led astray thanks to strange cultural beliefs. Before we get into this video, I ask that you have an open mind. It requires that you drop any preconceived notions of what domestication is often presented to be. You probably have some idea of what a domesticated animal is in your head. But if you and other people were to write down what this is, you'd notice that these ideas are wildly inconsistent. This is the exact same scenario in the scientific community. There is absolutely no consensus on what domestication is. We tend to think that we just kind of know a domesticated animal when we see one. And these species are usually widely owned, highly docile animals of which we are very familiar in whatever culture we happen to be a part of. Cats? Absolutely. Hamsters? Sure. Dogs? Most definitely. But tigers? No way. But why? What separates a tiger and other big cats from any of these species? Well, tigers are wild animals because they are dangerous and they can kill you. Why, yes, this is true. Tigers can kill you. But let's take a look at a tiger and a cat side by side. Is there perhaps a certain quality that a tiger has that might make it so dangerous? If you guess that tigers weigh around 50 times more than cats, you are correct. And even beyond size, cats, in part due to their size, have evolved to prey on small animals, while tigers, they've evolved to regularly kill very large animals, including adult water buffalo, leopards, bears, and even baby elephants. And yes, wild tigers have hunted and killed humans, unlike wild domestic cats. These animals possess incredible strength, and an adult tiger could kill a human in a matter of seconds. So if size were a way to define a domesticated animal, then I'd guess we'd have to include monkeys, birds of prey, and meerkats as domesticates, which most people wouldn't agree with. Size doesn't mean a tiger isn't domesticated, but what about its so-called wild instincts? Tigers have instincts, sure, but all animals have instincts. Yes, even cats. Cats do hunt their natural prey, believe it or not, when given the opportunity. And actually, I'd wager cats hunt more than socialized captive tigers, which form loving relationships with humans that would normally be their dinner in the wild. In fact, it is incredible that such a powerful animal can bond with primates that weigh far less than their typical preferred prey. Yes, socialization and hand raising are a big part of this. But such is the same with cats, which can easily go feral when raised without humans. So no, that doesn't count tigers out from domestication status either. But wait, I know what you're thinking. Domestication takes thousands of years, right? Er, no. I couldn't find a shred of evidence to support this popular claim. But I found evidence that domestication changes can occur in various tested species in 15 generations, 6 generations, and even one generation. How did the scientists make these assessments? Domestication syndrome is a theory first coined by Charles Darwin that denotes various behavioral and morphological traits that are genetically determined in domesticated animals. Traits like novel coat color, reduced brain size, smaller teeth, floppy ears, and a wider skull. Some of these changes were observed in the world-famous Russian farm fox experiment. It is important to note that no one trait has consistently been exhibited by species popularly considered to be domesticated. So technically, even if captive tigers didn't exhibit these changes, that wouldn't rule them out as domesticated. Of course, Captive tigers and other big cats are largely the same and are not physically different from their wild counterparts. Oh, wait, actually, it is well documented that big cats have undergone changes to their cranial facial structures, and such changes have also been noted in several other species. One paper notes, the skulls of captive big cats are wider with greater rostral and mastoid breaths, broader zygomatic arch widths, and broader mandibles than those of wild individuals. African lions tend to show drastic morphological changes associated with an increase in zygomatic breath, 
as well as smaller mandibular and maxillary regions of the skull and weaker bite force. While there have been more changes found in captive lion skulls than tigers, in emer tigers, there have been changes to the height of the sagittal crest. One paper notes, we found that captivity status is evident in felid cranial morphology and is even more pronounced than features of sexual dimorphism. And the fact that sex was the third principal component behind species and captivity status suggests that it is easier to tell the difference between captive and wild felids than it is to tell the difference between the sexes of the two species. Some quotes from another research paper, captive individuals appear to have flatter heads than the wild specimens against whom they were compared. The width of the skull across specimens was also noticeably different, as captives seem to have wider skulls than wilds. Within both species, mandibular angle variation was also evident across males and females. Unexpectedly, the second most important source of variation was most influenced by captive status, and not sex. This means that, after species, captive status is the most discernible characteristic across this population. Captive bait cats having greater skull widths relative to the length than wild bait cats is just one marker of domestication syndrome, yet scientists don't seem to be making the connection. Now, these changes can be due to different factors, notably phenotypic plasticity, which is a non-heritable and environmentally induced expression of the genome, as well as inbreeding and genetic bottlenecks, genetic drift, which is the disappearance of gene variants in a small population due to random chance, or even a combination of these factors. Oftentimes, the skull changes in captive felids are noted to be pathological, induced by unnatural diets such as soft food and abnormal muscle usage from overgrooming and pacing. Although poor quality of teeth is yet another marker of domestication syndrome. However, who's to say that these changes haven't occurred in other domesticated animals? There are, in fact, ways that environmentally induced changes can become heritable and be passed to subsequent generations. Epigenetics involves genes that are affected by behavioral and environmental factors, and these modifications, such as DNA methylation, can alter gene expression and become heritable. This is especially important when genetic variation is decreased, allowing small populations of animals to rapidly adapt to novel conditions, such as the significant selective pressures involved with living among humans in a captive environment and eating a modified diet. We do know that dogs actually evolved the ability to digest starches in response to scavenging from human-controlled settings. No one knows for sure at this time how these changes in the cats emerged, but given our cultural attitude against the idea that big cats are becoming domesticated, there is an incentive for scientists to assume these genetic changes must be due to health problems. The captive tiger population, like house cats, also has an increased prevalence of variations in their coat color, another marker of domestication syndrome. We know that inbreeding and intentional selection is the reason this has occurred, but that is not unlike what has happened to dogs when it comes to breed formation. In fact, it is normal for purebred dogs to have an inbreeding coefficient as high as 20%. One more known trait of domestication syndrome is increased docility. Most people don't believe tigers are docile because, again, Tigers are dangerous, and they've attacked and killed people, which of course dogs and other domesticated animals have never done. Yet, house cats would be dangerous if they were the size of tigers, and if house cats descended from the African wild cat, they've barely changed their size and weight. So it's not like domestication is responsible for shrinking animals to a preferable size. There have also been no recorded human fatalities from small cats, including those which are larger than house cats including medium-sized cats. Of course, there's been injuries, but bites from cats are a frequent cause of hospitalizations. We can't really test if captive tigers are more docile because of environmental influence
influence or genetic predisposition, or perhaps it's a mix of both. However, it is clear that tigers are certainly friendly with humans, despite their inherent danger, when raised with them in the same fashion as a house cat. Most importantly, tigers have been captive bred for ages. They readily breed in captivity from one generation to the next, with no need for importing wild animals, which is the case for some species. Even tame tigers will breed. Their reproduction instinct is not diminished from human habituation. And although this isn't a captivity-induced change, they have no breeding season and breed throughout the year. So why aren't tigers considered to be domesticated? Tigers may not serve a functional purpose like horses and dogs. However, neither do pet hamsters, another species that has been domesticated completely through captive breeding, also known as the directed pathway in domestication studies, instead of the commensal pathway, which has occurred with dogs and cats. It is perfectly acceptable for pet ownership and zoo display to be considered as a purpose for humans to domesticate an animal, and they serve that purpose well. That's no different from formation of koi fish breeds. So let's review. Tigers have potential genetically determined physical changes in captivity. They are docile, they have coat color changes, and they've been maintained in captivity for numerous generations. They clearly serve a purpose in human societies and breed readily and easily. There is little or no difference between tigers and other species that people accept to be domesticated. The tiger's size and danger are irrelevant. Only one conclusion makes any sense. Tigers are domesticated animals. The sooner we accept this, the better we will understand the animals in our care.